In this last lecture, I was planning to give you a pretty brief summary of the key concepts that we learned since the midterm. If we were to think about this course, Introduction to CPS as a System, and you might relate to this after learning about many systems, your knowledge has been transformed in the following ways. You should have learned how to model physical systems. These are differential equations with potential constraints. The differential equations may be nonlinear. And these are finite dimensional systems. The computer algorithms that we typically implement in a cyber component are also systems that can be modeled mathematically in certain situations. And we have learned how to do that for finite state machines that might have guards and might be non-deterministic, models of computation, and other type of discrete algorithms. At the same time, because we want to interface the physics to the cyber, we learn how to model certain interfaces such that uh, we can transfer information between these systems. And we cover simple models like digital to analog converter, analog to digital converter, and maybe more complicated models as networks with not periodic transmission events. And in many of the projects that I've been seeing and some of the homework problems, you have to adapt or build from these models to design the interface that you need for your particular situation. After the midterm, we got into more mathematical properties of the system that correspond to the dynamical behavior and, or characterize the dynamical behavior of these systems. And we define what an invariant would be. We define what the stability would be for a set or a point, also attractivity, and more recently, temporal logic. So we'll learn some ways to check these properties. One of them is to do it by simulations, and doing simulations is a good way to get intuition. We always need to remember that unless we have additional structure, we will be making only a check for a particular initial condition and for a approximated execution of the system. More powerful, but maybe more mathematically involved methods are analytical methods where we can now check the properties of the system by making sure that the flows and the jumps of the entire CPAs, CPS behave as we expect. And we gave some intuition behind that and more general tools and formally written tools will be presented in a follow-up course. So this is what we have covered, and for the final, we're going to evaluate specifically the analysis part, what came after the midterm, but as you realize, you will need to know how to model these systems to start with. And um, that's material that was already checked, but is somewhat um, included in the topics of, of the final. In terms of modeling, we concluded after several examples that we can actually model multiple classes of CPS as the combination of differential equations or inclusions, maybe with an input subject to a constraint that might constrain the state and the input as well, and that the events of the CPS can be captured by a set condition that might also involve the state and the input, and after the event, the variables that describe the behavior of the system, meaning the state x, which might be a very large vector, is actually updated instantaneously according to a difference equation or difference inclusion. And we were able to capture series interconnections, feedback interconnections, and other type of topologies that have come up in different homework problems and projects. I wanted to walk through some of the key concepts behind analysis and understanding how to check, in particular, the property of an invariant. Let's consider just for a minute that we have a nonlinear uh, continuous time system uh, of the form z dot equal f of z. This could be related to the plant or the physics of the system itself. So in our context, this could be fp. And if we have a set k that we would like to make invariant, then what we would like to have is that 
no matter where you start in this set, the executions to the system or the solutions to the system stay within the set. And we exercised this many times, and at times we actually exploited the property of having an analytical expression of the solution to the system and check where that solution will evolve over time and validate whether k was an invariant. If you remember, uh, quiz number five have very simple systems of this form, continuous time systems, where you had to check invariance of specific sets. And also there was a question about a discrete time system that um, would uh, you will need to understand an, a property of an invariant set or, or determine whether a set was invariant or not. And um, I suggest to, to go and review that from, from the quiz and, and the solutions associated to that. That's quiz number five. But to get an intuition on how to check this in more general terms, um, I mentioned this in one of the lectures, but let's just walk through it. If you would like to guarantee that Essentially, for the continuous time case, the trajectories are always flowing either into the set or tangentially to the set. Then one way to do that is to compute at points in the boundary of the set of interest, in this case k, the tangent vector to that set at a point c. So this point here will be z. And then calculate the angle between the direction of motion or the velocity of your state f at that point z relative to the tangent to that point, so this angle here that I call a. And if we can show that um, if a belongs to a particular range, then we would like to have that um, if this is zero angle and this is pi over 2, we would like to have that angle to be between 0 and pi, so that your velocity is always pushing you inside and to the right of this tangent line, if you will, defined by the direction of vc. So that's a quantity that actually is associated to the inner product, or the dot product, between the tangent and the function f that we are evaluating at points in the boundary of, of the set k and that can be generalized so this is one of the potential approaches to actually guarantee invariant of a set k analytically meaning that we can compute these directions and figure out how the directions at the tangent are relative to the directions of the velocity of the state and this extends to large dimensions as well. When you add the discrete part, in other words, when we are considering potentially a CPS, then we end up with a state corresponding to the CPS, let's call it eta, and eta at jumps will potentially very likely change because that's when the algorithm executes um, uh, its updates. And maybe during flows it changes as well, but as we saw in many examples, in particular for the finite state machine, this function fc for the cyber is actually zero, so that state for the FSM will be um, the logic state determining the uh, state of the finite state machine will not change during continuous evolution. But you can now think of a set k <coughs> right here, and this is your set D in red. And all we need to check is what happens from the set D intersected with K. So this cap corresponds to the intersection. So in this kind of orange type of set, we would like to guarantee that whenever there is a event trigger, then the state goes back to the set K. So as you see here, if this green area is what actually happens from points in the orange area, then there is no guarantee that every execution that starts from this orange area will stay in K. Therefore, the set K will not be invariant, in particular because there are jumps that map upside. So 
the key concept here is that we would like to have every time that there is an event that the jump map takes the value of the state back to the set k which is the one we would like to render in invariant okay <coughs> so that's the the key idea adding the the jumps for invariants and we can combine the two ideas and get an intuition in general on how to check invariant for a cps we also describe the property of attractivity attractivity is the property of the executions converging to a particular set now that convergence could occur after finite amount of time or in the limit in other words after infinite amount of time have elapsed in our setting because we are considering cps we have continuous change and discrete change and the continuous change is parameterized as we know by ordinary time t while the discrete change by the jump parameter j so in this picture right here what we are seeing is a set k that is a little ball here you could even consider it to be a point <coughs> um, let's say the origin of this um, state space in dimension 2 and what you see is that the direction of motion of the of the flow map right here for this system is taking you towards the origin okay and um, in this situation if you write down the differential equation for this system you end up with z1 dot equal to minus z1 and z2 dot equal to minus z2 so this is a very simple second order system where for every initial conditions you can realize that the component c1 and c2 of the execution exponentially converges to zero for c1 and zero for c2 so therefore um, the set zero zero which could correspond to this dot right here is attractive okay and that happens globally in the sense that no matter where you start your system you will have this convergence so this is a situation where happens in infinite amount of time okay and the one thing that you need to realize is that when you have an infinite kind of amount of time like or an asymptotic property of this type then it's not the case that there exists a time such that the state is in k okay actually what happens is that in the limit the state of the system will be such that a long execution is in the set k in the limit only so that's a significant difference difference between attractivity um, when attractivity occurs in a finite amount of time because if you were to have an algorithm that once you converge to the set something else needs to happen then you will never reach that particular set so therefore whatever you want to happen after you reach will never happen because again you only reach in this case the origin after infinite amount of time so basically you have run out of time so that's where finite time convergence becomes interesting and useful and therefore in those situations you need to find a time in this particular example it will correspond to a time t ordinary time but in our setting as you saw in the lectures it will correspond to a t and j such that the solution or the execution is in the set after such uh, time t and j and that's one type of property that requires sometimes non-smoothness and we will not get into details here but consider for a second a system on a line again just a continuous time system uh, it makes it easier to explain these ideas and let's say that the velocity of that state z is either 1 or minus 1 and whether it's 1 depends on or minus 1 depends on the sign of the state so for instance if z is positive and this is 0 k0 if z is positive then the sign of 1 is is is, is 1 minus um, the sign of positive number is 1 and minus 1 in front will mean that the velocity of z 
is uh, negative, so therefore the vector field will push towards zero. And if z is negative, then what we will have is that the sign of that negative number is, is negative when the minus in front will be positive, so then the state will push um, will be pushed towards the origin from below. So that's what the sign function is doing here, and at zero we can define it however we want it typically, and um, let's say that it's just zero. So if you take an initial condition of that system at one, the sign at the initial condition will be one, so therefore the derivative of c is equal to minus one, and then as time evolves, the solution from that initial condition will be equal to minus t plus one. Therefore, at one after one second, we are at zero. Therefore, we have approached the origin in a finite amount of time. Moreover, the sign of zero, assumed here to be zero, will stay at that particular point. Okay. So this is not only the case where k is a, a, a attractive set, but also is an invariant set. Okay. And the same analysis that we saw here can be done for the initial condition being minus one. Okay, so now you can think about this in other contexts, like for instance the thermostat problem, where under certain parameters we can show that the range of temperatures cross the possible values of a logic variable is actually an attractive set and also an invariant set. And we have seen this in other applications such as the vehicle application or the congestion control or the uh, water tanks problem. <coughs> Stability is the property that we define after and is a property that it is, is characterizing how far the executions will go when the executions start close to a particular set of interests. So if we have a set K, like for instance, the interval on a scalar system zero to one, the set K with delta larger than zero is given by an inflation by delta of this set. So zero plus minus delta is minus delta and one plus minus delta gives you one plus delta. So this is the inflated version of the interval zero to one. And we would like to have that um, that inflation is basically um, a set that, in this case, as you see, is contained necessarily the set K because that delta is constant, is a constant parameter, parameter for all possible values of the state. <coughs> so, um, so that's how we build the inflations, and then the stability notion, remember, was requiring the following for every epsilon that defines essentially an inflation around k there exists a delta that defines another inflation around k such that if i start in the delta inflation then i will stay within the epsilon inflation so typically delta is smaller than epsilon the solutions from within delta to the set might leave the delta inflation but will need to be within the epsilon inflation, okay? And this needs to happen during flows and also during jumps of the CPS. There was a discussion in one of the lectures about whether invariance implies stability, and there are certain cases, and I will leave that for you to understand, but there are examples, and one is here that um, shows that you don't necessarily have a stability of a set that is invariant. So more is required. Okay. <clears throat> For temporal logic, we introduce the basic connectives. We introduce the simple Boolean operators that we all should have known before this lecture, but then we introduce the temporal connectives, in particular next, always, eventually, and until, and we build some formulas for validating certain properties on certain systems, and we discuss how some of those formulas might require properties to occur after a finite amount of time, and therefore one needs to certify that 
using in particular finite time attractivity rather than infinite time attractivity. And then we discuss how to write down some specifications, like for instance for the temperature problem into a temporal logic formula. So this is the end of my summary and many of the topics that I describe are the discuss in more detail in the lectures and in the videos. You can prepare yourself for the final by focusing mainly on the material after the analysis, after the midterm with response to the analysis of the dynamical properties of these systems. <clears throat> but certainly as we said we will need to know how to model the, the systems in the first place and uh, we will cover everything up to lecture 16 including lecture 16